Good day, everyone. How's everyone doing? Just going to wait for more people to join in. Hope you're not loud shaped. What are we, level 432 now? It's difficult to keep up. Uh, gosh, yeah, my load shaping was earlier today in preparation for this live video. But if you are currently load shed, hopefully you're watching from your phone. Okay, just waiting for more people to join. Do, 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 do. Okay, we're going to start in a moment. Okay, we got a bunch of people already. Okay, so this is this. Let's just, um, sorry, Ugh. tongue twister. Let's get started, shall we? Hello, everyone. My name is Conrad on behalf of Camera Stuff. Um, today, we're going to talk about the different type of backdrops that we sell at Camera Stuff. Uh, namely PVC, cotton, paper backdrops, and also these variety of collapsible backdrops as well, and the various pros and cons of each. Um, during the live chat as well, I'm going to talk about the practical uses and how to keep the backdrops clean as well. So if you have any questions to ask, you know where to do so. So you can pop them in the comment section. And as I trot along with this live chat, I'll answer them to the best of my knowledge. If you have any questions concerning back, um, sorry, backdrops that we don't sell, um, you, know, you can ask those questions as well, and I'll ask and I'll answer them to the best of my knowledge. Okay, so let me know who's out there. Say hi in the comment section. All right, so concerning backdrops, as with many topics in photography, there's hardly ever a best of something. It all depends on what you want to use it for and what is best suited for you. So the same thing applies to backdrops as well. So a few considerations is how durable the backdrop is, how easy it is to transport, how easy it is to clean, and how good the photos will look in your photos. So options that we have include PVC vinyl material, cotton fabric material, and paper backdrops. Let's get my slide here going. All right, so to start off with, we're going to talk about PC vinyl backdrops. So PVC vinyl material is a very popular seller at camera stuff. Um, some of its major selling points is that it's very durable and easy to clean. Oh, yeah, so unless forced, uh, it is wrinkle and crease resistant. So typically, you wouldn't need to worry about photoshopping out any creases or wrinkles of such. So it's a nice, solid-looking backdrop. Um, something to keep in mind though, if any creasing or pinching does happen, you need to use like a hot gun or a hairdryer, or you need to lay out uh, the PVC in some in the hot sun. That will ease out any forced creases or pinch marks. Otherwise, these pinch marks and crease marks can be permanent unless you remove them with a bit of heat. So I've spoken about using the PVC material, um, saying that it's quite um, that it's wrinkle-free and crease resistant. But, and this is very important to say, you need to use a heavy duty crossbar. So if you use like a thin crossbar, because of the weight of the PVC, the PVC is about 10 to 13 kilograms. Because of the weight of the PVC, it may actually cause the, a weak crossbar to sag in the middle. And that's gonna create some warping and some misshaping of the background down the middle. Now that is something you're gonna see in your images. So just to show you, at camera stuff, by default, we sell our PVCs with thick um, 50 millimeter diameter crossbars. And they are one sectional as well. So they're not telescopic or multi sectional, which is a good thing. If you normally use a telescopic or multi sectional crossbar, um, those will have weak points. And you know, as stated, because of the, weak, um, the weight of the PVC, um, it's just going to drag those weak areas down and cause wrinkling and creasing down the middle. Yeah, so just to reiterate, at camera stuff by default, um, you, all of our PVCs include this thick um, aluminium crossbar. All right, so one of its major selling points is that the PVC is very easy to clean. Um, so after every use, you can just use a bit of handy andy in a mop to get rid of any foot marks or any spills and whatnot. Um, but to put emphasis on this, 
Uh, the PVC needs to be cleaned after every use. If you leave any stains or dirt to soak into the material, that's going to be very difficult to remove. Um, so ideally, after every use, make sure that the PVC is cleaned. Um, if you ignore the stains and what never, um, then the dirt may actually embed itself in the material itself and over time discolor uh, the white PVC itself. So just to reiterate, the PVC is easy to clean. So if you expect a lot of traffic on your backdrop, you know, dirty footprints or anything else that may end up messy, like smash the cake, shoots, um, any splash up photography, um, for stuff like that, the PVC is indeed a very worthwhile option. Um, now, speaking of splashes, when it comes to newborn photography or pet photography, because you know any accident may happen on a day, uh, PVC, I think, would be a good option there as well. Okay, so this is something quite less often spoken about. Uh, the type of shoe wear, that matters on a PVC. Um, so if the clients are wearing shoes with dark soles, like rubbery soles, that may actually burn and scuff marks into the PVC itself. And that is very, very difficult to remove. Um, at the Camera Stuff PVC, I'm sorry, the Camera Stuff Studio RPVC has a few of those scuff marks. Um, and I've heard of photographers needing to use Tipex or paint to remove that. So this is a problem that is best avoided beforehand. So you can ask your clients not to wear such shoes. Um, if it's unavoidable, you can just lay down sheets of paper, um, something that doesn't look inconspicuous, and ask your clients to step on that. I've even heard stories of photographers using masking tape underneath the shoes of their clients. So uh, it is something to think about. So the scuff marks are very difficult to remove. And I said, that's a problem ideally managed beforehand. OK, so when it comes to the PVC, they are quite difficult to transport. Uh, because you can't uh, fold it um, like a normal piece of material, because otherwise you're going to create permanent crease marks. The PVC itself needs to be kept um, on its crossbar. So you need to roll it up onto its crossbar and move it around like that. Um, so if you have a small car, it's going to look like this. You're going to need to stick your PVC outside of the passenger side window. If you have a big buck, your 4 by 4 it's not a concern. Uh, but for smaller vehicles, if you normally shoot on location, if you hop from one place to the next, uh, this is how you're going to move the PVC around. Now, just be careful not to joust any pedestrians along the way. Um, so it's not the most practical option, if I can call it that, um, in regards to uh, travel. If you are a traveling photographer, there are better options out there, but I don't want to make it sound impossible. Uh, it can be managed um, if you take care of your PVC backdrop like this. So as you see here in the image itself, uh, don't do that. Don't do what I did uh, because the window itself may create a crease mark. So where the PVC makes contact with the door and the window, just make sure you rub, um, wrap some bubble wrap or a towel around that uh, just to avoid any pinch marks. Okay, so... PVC backdrops, um, you may have seen, have a black backing. So you may think you're getting like a two-in-one special. You get like a white side and a black side. Now, the black side can be used, but it's very, very difficult to do so. And I'll show you why. Uh, the black side, the black backing, is very textured, and it's quite reflective when any light um, is illuminated on it. So I'm just going to show you a video here. Yeah, so you see, as, as soon as any light makes contact with it, you can see the patterns, and it's very, very reflective as well. So there's something that can be done. You can use the black side, but uh, you need to be very clever with your lighting. So in other words, um, you need to use directional lighting. So you want to keep light off your backdrop. So you need to use like a gridded softbox or a gridded honey, um, gridded beauty dish and aim the light at your subject, but ideally past the backdrop itself, because you don't want any light spillage on the backdrop. Uh, this includes ambient exposure as well, so window lights, ceiling lamps, anything that will hit the backside of the PVC will reflect. So you want to manage all of the light in your studio to avoid all of that. Um, otherwise, personally speaking, I would just 
not considered for black side of a PVC as a practical option. I would just go with cotton or paper instead. Because I have tried to use the black side and it just was a nightmare, really. All right, so that's basically the PVC in short. So it's a great solid looking backdrop. So it is crease and wrinkle resistant unless you force it. And it does require a bit of force to do that. But otherwise, um, the idea behind a PVC is, you know, if you have it in the studio, you kind of want to leave it there. Um, you don't want to travel around with a PVC that often. You know, I've seen photographers who have this love-hate relationships with the PVC because they move the PVC around too often. So if you have a studio, you're not planning on moving around a lot, then the PVC is indeed a very, very good option especially if you want a white backdrop. Okay, I'm just going to show you a video of what that looks like. So this is the Camera Stuff Studios. So that's me rolling up the paper. Okay, I don't know if that's frozen. Okay, I think I may have been frozen my side. Just give it a moment. Okay, sorry about that, guys. I don't know what happened, but hopefully you're still with me and I'm with you. <laughs> okay, uh, give me a shout out if everything is looking okay, if nothing is frozen again. Uh, just in the comment section, just give me a thumbs up or anything of the sort if everything is looking hunky dory again. All right. So. I'm just going to try and get that video again. Hopefully it doesn't bomb again. All right, all good. All right, so that's me rolling down a PVC. So otherwise, a nice solid lean backdrop, just getting the chair out of the way. Now, so no wrinkles, warps, um, any misshaping of the backdrop whatsoever. So let's let Photoshop out afterwards, if I can call it that. Okay, I'm just reading the comments here. All right, so I have the big black, white, black and white backdrop that I ordered from you guys. It's been hanging for about two years now and it's still going strong. Okay, well, that's good news. I find the white side has a slight blue cold white tone to it, um, but I think I can deal with it in post-processing. Um, yeah, so that I think needs to be managed with the white balance and the type of lighting that you're using as well. Um, yeah, so just uh, drop us an email with some example images and the camera settings that you're using, and we'll try and tackle it from there. Now, otherwise, it's not a thing I've experienced with our PVCs, but um, yeah, so hopefully we can you know, solve the problem for you. Yeah, so just drop us an email with example photos, share with us what your camera settings are, and we can just take it from there. Okay, for the transport transportation, should I say, of the 2.6 PVC, you can use suction caps. Um, so is that referring to the suction caps that we place on top of the car's roof? That's quite interesting. I've never seen that. Please show some images of that. I'm very keen to see that. Okay, so barring any more mishaps, let's continue on. Just going to get my slideshow again. Okay, 
So on to paper backdrops. Okay, so personally speaking, I think the paper backdrop is the best looking backdrop for photographic reasons um, out of the, all of the other backdrop options here because they just look better in photo. The reason I say this is because they are non-textured and non-reflective. So obviously, unless you force it, these are also wrinkle and crease resistant um, and not as glossy as PVC as well. So you're not going to get any like nasty specular reflections on the backdrop itself. So the paper backdrop, I would say, is a better looking backdrop as far as photographic reasons are concerned. Also with paper, there are a variety of colors available, not just white, black, or chroma key green. So if you want more options, um, paper has plenty of those available. Okay, so the biggest drawback of paper backdrops is they are easy to damage. Um, so when a part gets dirty or damaged, you need to cut off that section and roll down a fresh section. So you can say back, um, paper backdrops are disposable for this reason. Um, and also a reason why they are typically sold in 11 meter rolls or 30 meter rolls. So once you run out of fresh paper, you need to buy a new one. So over the long run, paper backdrops, you can say it's the most expensive option out of everything mentioned here. Um, you know, they're not reusable um, once they get dirty or damaged, any liquid damage, etc. Um, yeah, so you just need to cut off that portion. Um, yeah, so and roll down a fresh section thereafter. Yeah, and as mentioned, once you roll out, it would be time to buy a new backdrop. So just on a side note, I have seen photographers use paper off cuts. Now, so if you um, cut off a section, don't throw it away. So try and recycle it. So photographers, I've seen some just crumple this massive piece of off cut and then lay it flat um, and put it on a backdrop stand. So when you do that, you can create this unique papered texture in your images itself. Yep, so recycling is always, always a good idea. Also, for paper backdrops, you can say uh, special care is needed to prevent unnecessary loss. So what I mean by that, um, it again, is a problem that is best managed uh, beforehand. So ideally, don't step on it. The only person who should be stepping on a backdrop itself would be the model. Um, if you're forced to do so, take your shoes off. If you have any um, like foot marks on the paper itself, um, you can use a, paper, um, a pencil eraser just to rub that off gently. So obviously you can't use like liquid cleaners. Um, you know, so if you have like foot marks on the backdrop itself, you can just use a pencil eraser to hopefully get rid of that. Okay, also another trick is when you roll the paper back up onto its crossbar, um, just make sure that you sweep it clean because you don't want any like pieces of debris on the paper itself um, because of that, um, gets rolled up into the roll itself, then any pieces of debris may leave an imprint um, and or may actually damage the paper itself. Now that may go down to the middle of the roll itself. So just be careful with that. And also, I think this is the most important one. When you store backdrops, do so vertically. If you store the paper backdrop horizontally, the, paper, um, the weight of the paper itself may compress onto the carton tube. And that will create misshaping and um, warping of the paper backdrop itself. Now, so the carton tube that the paper backdrop is rolled on, um, now that gets compressed over time because of the weight of the paper. Now, that's going to ruin the entire paper. So, ideally, you want to store the paper backdrop vertically against a wall, um, but preferably in a paper backdrop storage holder. Now, those we don't sell, unfortunately, but there are some due to self options available out, um, out there. So you can take a thick piece of PVC, cut it in little sections, mount it against the wall, and slide your paper into that. Okay, so this applies to, well, it's the same advice when you keep the paper backdrop rolled up onto a backdrop stand or one of these expanders. You don't want to do that over a stretch of time. So when the paper backdrop is not in use, store it vertically. You don't want to use it or store it or leave it onto its, um, on, of the paper, um, sorry, onto the paper backdrop stand itself. 
Okay, so I got a question here. Now, this is a very, very good um, you know, piece of advice. So if you want a reflection, you can use Perspex um, and lay it down on the paper itself on the floor of the paper, and that will create a bit of a reflection. So if you want that or don't want that, it is an option. Um, I've seen photographers create some stunning images with that. Um, yeah, so just a big piece of Perspex laid down on top of the paper, and you'll get that reflection. Now, that also looks very, very awesome with different colors as well. Okay, another big piece of advice here, don't use paper, and this applies to PVC as well, uh, don't use paper on matted or carpeted floors. So obviously you can imagine someone wearing a high heel stepping on a paper. That's just going to punch holes in the paper and will create uh, ugly pinch marks on PVC itself. Um, so just be careful not to use it on carpets or mats whatsoever. Um, so ideally you want to lay down a piece of wood or perspex or plexiglass and lay the paper backdrop on top of that. Um, yeah, but as mentioned, you don't want to use it on carpets or matted floors whatsoever because someone with high heels is going to punch holes into it. Okay, here's another trick as well. Use A clamps to prevent roll down. So something like this. So um, because gravity is a thing, uh, the paper backdrop can unroll itself uncontrollably. Um, so what you can do is use a couple of clamps just on the sides of the um, paper crossbar or carton tube itself, and that will just prevent any unnecessary roll down. That happened to me once or twice before. Um, yeah, the entire backdrop is ruined <laughs> after. Um, you know, so ideally, you want to use these clamps just to keep the backdrop um, you know, in place. All right. So before we go to cotton, I'd just like to say that paper backdrops are typically sold in full size or half size lengths. At camera stuff, you can choose between 2.7 meter wide paper backdrops or 1.3.5 um, meter backdrops, uh, the width of it as well. So full length or half length, half length. So if you do full body shots, ideally get the full length. Um, if you do only portraits or smaller products, then the half length would be ideal for you. Okay, so that's paper basically done and dusted, all of the pros and cons. So just to sum up, uh, yeah, it's a personal opinion of mine, but uh, I think paper backdrops are the best looking backdrops as far as photographic reasons are concerned. Um, so if you want something that doesn't wrinkle, warp, um, crease whatsoever, unless forced, obviously, the paper backdrop is the better option to use. Um, but the paper backdrop in the long run is the most expensive one because it is disposable. Once a section gets dirty or damaged, you need to cut that piece off. Uh, you can recycle it, as I've shown you, but uh, you know, once you run out of paper, it's a case of you needing to buy a new one. Okay, got a question here. Does the paper roll fit onto the 50 millimeter, 50 millimeter aluminum crossbar? Um, no, it doesn't. Um, so it's something I've done in the camera stuff studio. Um, I unroll the paper backdrop and I roll it onto the aluminum crossbar. So it's a way of swapping the crossbars. You just need to roll one, the paper backdrop from one crossbar to the other. Now, so unfortunately, it's about the same size, the carton tube and the aluminum crossbars that we sell. Um, so you can't stick one into the other. So you need to carefully roll one onto the other crossbar. Okay. Okay, let's jump to cotton backdrops. All right, so cotton backdrops otherwise are the easiest to travel with. So a 3.6 or 3 by 6 meter backdrop, you can easily shove into a bag or a pillowcase, throw it on your car, back seat, or in the boot itself, and be on your way. So they are very, very easy to travel with. So if you are a traveling photographer that needs to hop from one location to the next very often, um, the other cotton backdrop would be the best option for you. Um, they are otherwise also very easy to clean. Um, you can pop them into the washing machine. Um, 
ironing them is a bit of a nightmare. I've tried that myself. It's like wrestling a bear. <laughs> um, but a uh, preferred option would be to put it on his um, backdrop stand and use a steam iron instead. So don't, you know, if you have patience for a flat iron, you can do that, but uh, preferably just put it on a backdrop stand and use a steam iron instead. Now, the big concern with the cotton, you know, as I said, they are easy to, cre um, easy to crease, easy to wrinkle. I'm just going to show you a video there. Hopefully the live chat doesn't bomb out. Okay, so this is a cotton backdrop fresh out of its bag. Yeah, I can see the nasty blocky crease marks in it. It is something otherwise which you can remove, but every time you travel with a um, with a cotton, there's going to be some crease mark or wrinkle marks of the sort. So it's just kind of a reality that needs to be dealt with. Um, and if you don't have a steam iron on location, uh, what you can do is um, you can clamp the cotton to the sides of the backdrop stand itself so you can use clamps for that um, as a way of stretching it out but yeah even if people start moving on a backdrop itself it's just going to create right lines and wrinkles and creases and such so it's going to take some spinning in photoshop to get rid of those crease marks but that being said um, i think with a cotton for muslim backdrops i think it's a case of embracing it embracing the creases and whatnot but with it, you can create unique patterns. You can create like a curtain effect. You can create those wrinkly um, patterns as well. And that otherwise can look good in your images as well. So if you plan on doing something like this, um, don't fold your cotton backdrop in neatly. Don't do that because you're going to create these blocky lined creases. Instead, crumple it with purpose and just shove it in a bag or a pillowcase. Now, once you pull it out, the creases and the wrinkles will be more so uniform, equally distributed, if I can call it that. Um, so it's going to look a bit more so, did I use the word, a bit more naturally textured as opposed to something that obviously has these lines and whatnot. Yeah, so otherwise with cottons, I would say wrinkle it with intent and with it you can create these interesting patterns with it. Got a question here. Yeah. Okay, in turn for storage, what if you have your backdrops paper mounted on those motorized chained high ceiling mechanisms? Uh, forgot the name of those supports. Um, I think you got, no, you got it right. Uh, do you have to take them off and store them vertically all the time? Um, yeah, ideally, yes. Um, it also depends on the type of crossbar that you're using with it. Um, if you have a metal aluminum crossbar, the danger isn't as extreme as with just the carton tube itself, because that is the problem itself. It's the carton tube that um, compresses over time. So if you have an aluminum crossbar, uh, the danger is not that extreme whatsoever. Um, yeah, so it just depends on the crossbar that you're using with everything. If you're using it with the paper, um, sorry, if you're using the paper with the um, carton tubes, then yes, um, uh, just swap them out every now and then. Um, and if you're not using them extensively, just pop them vertically from time to time. It's not a thing that's going to be noticeable immediately, but over time, like one year, two years time, you're gonna maybe see that warping come, you know, come into the equation eventually. So it's just about um, prolonging the life or the use of your paper backdrop. So you know, as I said, it's not something that's gonna happen immediately, but just over the you know, course of a few years time, I you know, just wanna take care of your paper backdrops in that sense. Do, 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 do. All right, so I'm liking the questions. Keep them coming in, please. Do, 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 do. Just going back to my slide. All right, so in regards to cotton backdrops, um, ideally don't place them in front of a window because um, the light through the window will shine through the material itself. Um, it depends on the quality, obviously, but for most uh, cotton fabric type materials, I'm going to have a bit of and sunlight you know, creeping through the material itself and that it can be extremely noticeable um so if you are otherwise forced to place your backdrop in front of your windows definitely paper or pvc 
Uh, cotton, depending on the time of day, is going to have some issues to deal with in regards to the sunlight. All right, so like the paper, there are many sizes available. Uh, camera stuff, we have the 3x6. We also have 1.8 by 3 um, meter ones available. Yeah, so you're not restricted to the large one option only. Um, now, so if you're doing, as mentioned, portraits, smaller products, still life photography, um, macro photography, you don't need the big option, obviously. Now, so we have those smaller ones available as well. All right, so those are the few options that we have. Um, well, the main options. So we have cotton, paper, and PVC. So just to go over or gloss over cotton um, just yet again. So the easiest to travel with, if you hop from one place to the next very often, uh, the most practical option in regards to portability. They do crease, they do wrinkle very easily. Um, so you need a steam iron handy on location to get rid of those. Um, if not, some Photoshopping will be required to clone out any crease marks. Um, otherwise, you can, as I said, embrace the nature of the cotton backdrop itself. Um, so you can wrinkle it and crease it and crumple it with intent. Um, and that can create some unique patterns as well. Um, yeah, that's basically it in regards to cotton paper versus PVC. So I'm going to pause a little bit here. Um, because I am hoping to get more questions. So if you have any questions regarding paper, PVC, and cotton, uh, please shoot, sir. Uh, please shoot. This is the point of doing the live videos. We kind of want to interact with you guys. Okay, so I see a few coming in. All right, so before I get to those questions, what colors to buy? So maybe I'm going to put it up to a vote. In the comment section, what is your favorite backdrop color to use? Or what would you think is a good first purchase? Okay, so in regards to the color, I think if it is your first purchase, white and gray would be the most versatile um, in a sense, well, it if you're clever with your camera settings and clever with your lighting, you can change the color of a white or gray paper backdrop um, and you can change the exposure as well. So you can make it lighter or make it appear darker as well. So as a first purchase, these would be the most versatile because um, you have options beyond just the color that the backdrop is itself. So with these examples, I'm using my mannequin head again. <laughs> um, so this was the same gray backdrop, gray paper backdrop. Um, so I didn't change anything. I just changed some lighting and some camera settings. So the backdrop remains the same. So as you can see, you can be a bit more, you can be extremely versatile with it. So what you see here, you can do with white as well. To an extent, you can do it with black as well, but black, you need plenty of light. So you need a little, um, very very powerful light to get a similar effect to this one um so with gray white um you can play around with different lighting different camera settings and yeah get different results so i'm seeing votes for gray and white since we're saying yeah gray is good can be turned into every color you want so you're kind of a step ahead of me since we well done okay so how to get these different effects so for a darker backdrop, you want to use directional lighting to prevent light spillage. So the idea basically is, is that you aim for light on your subject itself. So you want to use like a gridded softbox, gridded beauty dish, snoot, bond order for grid attached. So you aim the light directly at the subject and you avoid any light spillage, any light from hitting your backdrop itself. Um, ideally, you want to move the model away from the backdrop too to prevent light spillage. And use a smaller aperture like f8, f11, f16, whereabouts, um, to prevent any ambient exposure on the backdrop itself. So you just want to kill all light on the backdrop itself. So with a gray backdrop, even a white backdrop, you can make it pitch black. For lighter backdrops, you need to use additional backdrop lights on the backdrop itself. So you need to have two additional lights or 
maybe one additional light. You can escape with just one, but if you're doing portraits, if you're doing full length body shots, you need two placed behind your subject and aimed at the backdrop itself. Um, yeah, so these two additional lights are used to illuminate the backdrop independently away from the subject. And obviously, very often you need your two lights for your subject too. So the lighting setup is going to look like this, more or less. Um, two lights for the backdrop. This will light up the backdrop itself, and obviously you're lighting for the model as well. So you need to think of this setup as having two exposure zones. Um, exposure one would be that of the model that is determined by the two front lights. The next exposure zone is that of the backdrop that is determined or exposed by the two uh, backdrop lights. So what you don't want is for the backdrop lights to fiddle with your model. Um, you don't want any kickback from the backdrop. You don't want any light spillage creeping onto the model itself. Um, yeah, otherwise, if you increase the intensity of the lights, the backdrop lights too much, too much light will be reflected off the backdrop. It will wrap around your subject and it will enter your camera's lens. And that's going to create a bit of a hazy photo and will create a bit of lens flare. Now, unless you want that look, by all means, go for it. Uh, but it's just something you want to be careful with. You want to find that balance of nice white backdrop, but don't crank it up too high because it's going to create too much kickback. Okay, so I said in the comment section already, you can use gels or color filters. Um, so you can tape these gels onto the um, backdrop lights itself. If you're using soft boxes or umbrellas on the backdrop lights, you just need to figure out a way to mount the gel inside the soft box. So you can use gaffer tape for that or magnets. Um, this effect is ideally used for portraits and free body um, three quarter body shots. When it comes to full length body shots, uh, the color is not going to fall on the floor itself. So you're going to have this color, 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 and it's going to go back to gray on the floor itself. So when it comes to portraits, three quarter body shots, this is a very, very good um, technique if you just want to change colors on the fly. Okay, this is something I practiced with quite a while ago. You can use RGB lighting if you're using continuous lighting, RGB lighting. Um, I'm going to drop the article in the comment section itself. So that will be a bit more detailed um, just to show you where the lights go, what equipment was used, et cetera, et cetera. So again, well, here a white PVC was used. And yep, with some RGB lighting, you can change backdrops just like that. Or change backdrop colors, should I say, just like that. Um, if you want to forego all of these techniques, you know, not bother and just buy the colored backdrop, just kind of um, make it less hassle free, you can do that. So, as I said, at Camera Stuff, we have all of these colors available. Um, yeah, so, if you don't want to bother with all of these techniques I just described, by all means, just buy the color itself. Okay, just as a reminder, I am going to drop that article in the comment section, so be sure to be on the lookout for that. Okay, so here's something else to talk about, um, collapsible backdrop. So we have these available as well. Um, so we have the green, blue, chroma key, double-sided ones available. We have white and black double-sided ones available as well. Um, they are, have this nylon, cotton, polyester blend material. So they are prone to crease as well, but again, nothing a steam iron can't fix. Um, so this is great for location work or if you have or need to create a makeshift studio at home. Um, so if you don't have a studio as such and you need to create a makeshift one every now and then, this is a perfect option. Um, as I said, we have white and black ones available too. Uh, the only problem with this really is you can't do full length body shots because the fabric doesn't extend on the floor itself. But otherwise, yeah, it's a great option. So we do have these stands available for these as well. Um, you don't strictly need to use the stand. You can just lean this or rest this against the wall. If you need a bit of height out of it, if you want to place it a bit higher, just put it on a box or a chair and just rest it parallel against the wall. Yep. So if you need to pack light, if you do travel around a lot, if you need to create makeshift studios here and there, this is a great option. Um, and we have videos available as to how to fold it as well. That's one of the trickiest bits. But yeah, for portability's sake, this is a great option. Okay, so I think that's kind of my 
you know, my slideshow is done. So if you have any questions to ask, please do so. So I do have the lighting diagrams ready. So if you want to change backdrop color, you can place a light behind the subject, put a gel on it, and depending on how you tweak the intensity of the light, you can get different saturations um, as well. So the lesser the intensity, the less prominent the color will be, obviously, if you increase the light, the more saturated, the more colorful, in a manner of speaking, the, the gel will be, the backdrop will be. Now, so it's an otherwise easy technique. So this is about placing light behind a subject, aim it directly at the subject. So that's a quick and nasty way as to how to attach the gel onto the backdrop um, light itself. Um, here I just used duct tape or gaffer tape, whatever it may have been. Um, but yeah, so if you have a softbox or umbrella, there are ways to do that as well. So you can just tape the gel itself in the softbox. That's an option. If you have an umbrella that you need to use, you just need to poke a hole uh, through the gel itself and allow the umbrella shaft to go through that. But yeah, there's always a do-it-yourself option. So if you want to change the color of the backdrop, just pop a gel on the backdrop light itself. Obviously, if you're doing full-length body shots, uh, ideally not the preferable way to go about it but you know for portraits and three quarter body shots an awesome technique here you can see two examples of a beauty dish being used on a subject one without a grid and one with a grid so just to repeat same beauty dish was used and obviously for beauty dishes you can buy these honeycomb attachments and here you can see the difference without honeycomb on the left hand side and on the right hand side with honeycomb grid attached. So same gray paper backdrop made pitch black. So it's all about constraining or keeping that light away from the backdrop. And that is what the honeycomb um, grid is designed to do. It's designed to uh, constrain the amount of light into a spotlight, into a narrow beam. So all the light is going where you want it to go. So you don't have any light spillage you know, going all over the show. Okay, so that's a good technique as well. So if you want a darker backdrop, credit light modifiers can do the trick. If you want a darker backdrop as well, um, you can ask the model to step away from the backdrop. Um, now I think this is fairly obvious. You know, if the model is positioned close to the backdrop, you're going to have some light spillage on the backdrop itself. But as soon as you move everything away, light including model as well, you're going to have less of that light on the backdrop itself. So it's a nice little technique if you want a darker backdrop. Okay, so that's me pretty much done. So it's gonna go to comments. Okay, so I think this is referring to the collapsible folding backdrops. Folding down those pop-up backdrops is a hassle. The bigger it is, the hassle -ier. It's a nice word. <laughs> um, it is. I bought one, um, used it twice, and never went back to it again. Um, okay, as I said, we have the videos um, and the step-by-step -step procedures. Um, once you have the technique right, it's you know, it's just seems to be after. Um, you know, it's, it can be like wrestling a bear or wrestling a python if you don't know the technique. But you now, once you have that technique right, it's you know, it's fairly easy to do thereafter. Uh, did, 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 did. Sean Boyce and saying, I purchased a white backdrop with gel, so Monday going to try that out. Um, by all means, it's uh, it's such a great technique if you just want to add a splash of color to your backdrop. So if you have a white backdrop, you can purchase these gels, stick it on your backdrop light. Um, if you're using constant lights, you can use RGB lighting for the same effect. If you're using flashes, just stick that on the backdrop light and you, know, you can be very creative with that. Um, if you use gels on strobes, just take out the modeling lamp, especially if it's a halogen modeling lamp. Um, I've done that once. The modeling lamp just melted the gel, almost created a fire hazard. So if you're using strobes, um, if, especially halogen modeling lamps, unscrew that, put it away. Don't use it with the gel. 
Did it, did it, did it. All right. So, well, I'm done with my slideshow. So, I'm just waiting for more questions. So, if you have questions to ask, um, well, I can't be here the whole night, but it depends on you. <laughs> Let's see if I missed any questions. Do, 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 do. Okay, so if you don't have questions to ask, that means I did a good job. <laughs> but I'm still waiting for one or two odd more questions still. Okay, well, hopefully that um, hopefully I've illuminated you with some uh, extra bits of knowledge concerning backdrops, be it paper, PVC, cotton backdrops, these collapsible backdrops itself, um, how to you know, take care of these backdrops, how to prolong their, their life in a manner of speaking. Um, you know, what is best for traveling, what is best for in-studio use. Um, I can quickly reiterate some points. PVC, if you have a studio, what a good white backdrop. PVC is a good option, especially if you do messy photography, whatever that may be. Um, you know, if you expect a lot of traffic on a backdrop, foot marks, um, liquid damage, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, for PVC is a great option because it's otherwise easy to clean, but clean it after every use because you don't want the PVC itself to discolor over time. Um, paper backdrops, I would say, is the best looking backdrop. So uh, if you had to ask me the question what I would buy, paper backdrop, 10 times out of 10. Um, but I have a studio, so the paper backdrop stays there. So I don't travel around very often. Um, yeah, so if you do travel around very often, if you have a small vehicle, um, Cotton would be a great option or one of these collapsible backdrops. But again, I don't want to make it sound more difficult. It may be if you want a PVC, if you still want to travel around with it, you can do that. It's just a case of taking good care of it. Same thing applies to the paper as well. Um, yeah, so as I said at the beginning, there's no such, you know, in photography, there's hardly ever a best of something. So it just depends on how you want to use it and what is best suited for you. Um, yeah, so if you still have questions to ask, if you're still uncertain, like your camera stuff, we have many ways of reaching us. So we have WhatsApp, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have email, we have telephone, we have live chat function on a website available as well. Uh, we do respond within business hours very, very quickly. So we have dedicated people um, ready to answer, answer your questions. And, and also we are photographers as well. So we can, we're not just guesstimating stuff, so we can help you um, from a photographer's point of view, definitely. Um, but a bit, a bit, a bit. Yep, so hopefully I covered everything. So I'm just seeing a bunch of comments here. Thank you for the excellent live presentation. It's a big, big pleasure. Sean Boyce, and I put transparent glass on all my backdrops so it doesn't become that messy. And that's a good option as well. Never thought about that. Um, so do you get the reflections as well? So that's something you're after, Sean? I'll be keen to see those results. Something I haven't tried myself, you know, a bit of perspex or glass on the backdrop. Yeah, so I'm quite keen to see those results, Sean. Yes, you did a good job. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much for the informative session. Looking forward to the next one. Uh, yeah, so that's going to be scheduled next week. Um, have a couple of talking points. Um, I just need to see what I have in my camera bag and in my studio here as to what I'm going to do a presentation on, but, but be announced very, very soon. Uh, thank you, Conrad. Uh, very informative. It's a pleasure, Greg. And Prince Ryan saying, I would like to buy a gray paper backdrop soon. And I would say that's a very, very good first choice. But the gray paper backdrop, I think, is something every studio photographer should have. Uh, 
All right, so off topic, is there a big difference between a white and a silver reflective umbrella? I have silvered, um, but considering getting white uh, specifically for maternity photography. Okay, um, a few talking points here. White versus silver reflective. So typically with silver, you're going to get a harsher um, reflection of light out of it. So you're going to get more light intensity. So that's going to play into the contrast of light as well. So your bright areas are going to look a bit lighter and your dark areas are going to look a bit darker. Whereas for white, it gives off, and I hate using this word, it gives off a bit of a creamier uh, look to the light. So it's not as specular, it's not as harsh as the silver itself. Uh, for white, um, has a bit of a warmer color temperature, whereas the silver has a bit of a colder color temperature. Um, that to me is not, uh, it's all big news. You can't change your white balance to fix it otherwise. But um, I would say silver is good to use if you, if you have weak lighting. So if you have like LEDs or these fluorescent lamps, the silver is a good option because that helps to maintain the intensity of light. Whereas white reflective, you may lose a bit more light than the silver itself. So you're going to end up losing light and you need to compensate for that with your ISO or aperture or shutter speed of or you feel the sort. Um, yeah, so say I would say the white is the safer option. Um, it's generally more flattering. It's not as harsh as the silver, whereas the silver, you can get this great specular contrast out of it that uh, especially a lot of fashion photographers like um, because it adds a bit of shine to fabric um, and also on the face itself to so have that dare I say shiny look to the face almost glowy look to the face so again there's no best one this just depends on how you want to use it so you know, have both ideally Here's a good question. Please advise on video light between Godox SL60 versus Godox LED 500. Okay, so it's not a 500 watt, it's just the model number itself. It infers that it has 500 LED beads, so it's not a 500 watt per se. Um, for Godox SL60, which is a 60 watt, um, I would advise that one because it has the speed ring mount up front. So you have options as far as your lighting modifiers are concerned. So you can mount soft boxes, umbrellas, beauty dishes, barn doors, snoots, etc. to the LS, um, sorry, the SL60. So you have options as far as crafting your light is concerned. So you can choose big light, small light, soft light, hard light, contrasty light, um, the flat lighting, etc. or a combination of everything I just mentioned. Um, which I think is the game you want to play as a photographer. You want to control and manage and dictate the light. Whereas with the LED 500, that's just a panel. So you can soften that up with a scrim. You can maybe MacGyver an umbrella to it as well. Um, so there are options as, as far as modifying an LED panel is concerned, but the options are not as um, convenient as with the LS, um, sorry, Keep on saying Alice, it's the SL60 because it has a speed ring modifier um, mount up front. So you can just slot in your different modifiers. So you don't need to do it yourself, MacGyver anything to soften the LED 500. It's a bit of a long answer, but between the two, SL60. Yeah, but then again, it also depends on space. LED panels are great to use if you have minimal space to work in. Um, whereas with the SL60, once you pop a softbox onto it, uh, it does. It's quite a chunky thing to have in a studio, so it's going to take up a lot of space. So it also depends on the amount of space that you have. Do -do 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 -do. Okay, so I think that's me done. Um, Okay, so I'm going to leave you good people. Hopefully that was a good video. Hopefully it was very informative. Um, hopefully you have a better idea as to what backdrop you need to buy. Um, that is suited for you, your studio, if you're traveling around, whatnot, etc. Uh, if not, if you still have questions, still have some concerns, please raise it with us. We are widely available. Um, so again, just to remind you, Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook, live chat on our website, email, telephone, etc. You can reach us and we are happy to answer your questions. Okay, so that's 
me done. Um, enjoy the rest of your night. Hopefully you don't have load shedding now or in the next few moments. Um, but yes, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. So next live video will be announced very soon. Um, and do stick around. Hopefully we'll see you with that one as well. Bye-bye.